you're visiting a photo PXL edit raws with Kevin presentation. Um, this is, we're all in a, a different world these days with the pandemic and uh, our lack of travel and things. You know, I had a full year's worth of workshops all set to go and sold out. And, uh, you know, that got pulled out from under us right after we did the Antarctica workshop. And um, I had some plans to do some very interesting videos where we went places and were able to visit with some people and behind the scenes at one or two manufacturing facilities. And, of course, that's got squashed. So essentially, you know, we've got kind of a year, it's kind of a time off year. And I thought, well, we have that time. We'll start doing some interesting uh, presentations using the technologies that we're all accustomed to now, specifically uh, Zoom and virtual uh, meetings. Um, as we move forward, um, some of these could be, you know, more interesting. Uh, we might bring in a guest lecturer here and there also. Uh, you do know that we're doing conversations with, and we've done a number of those. We got a really epic one coming up that uh, Jeff's working on now. We finished the videos. It's almost a three and a half hour, four hour video, right, Jeff? We'll be yes, doing with that. Stephen Wilkes. Yeah, with Stephen Wilkes, who is probably one of the more interesting living legend photographers right now. He's doing some very, very interesting projects. And we, we cover from the beginning when he started to where he is today with some of the most recent projects dealing with the pandemic. So uh, that'll be coming up as an article. And it's one of those ones where, you know, you can kind of find an hour and sit down and watch one of the videos. Really is quite interesting. And it's very rare to get a speaker where you can do something that extensive and that long. So Jeff and I did that together with Steven and uh, there's a lot of images and some really interesting historic stuff in there. So hope you enjoy that when it comes up. We have Phil, uh, we have a Phil coming up and a couple other ones, uh, William Neal's uh, uh, probably within the next week or so too. So we, we're working on a bunch of things. Anyway, thank you for coming here today. And um, I thought it'd be fun to uh, talk about editing raw images. I just finished judging the Roberts photo contest with several thousand images. And it got me to thinking is that there were a lot of really good images uh, that were submitted that would not turn out to be winners, mainly because they lacked uh, simple things such as cropping and uh, a little bit of finesse in the raw processing side of things. So I thought I'd kind of take a moment and at least one hour here and share with you how I would uh, edit some raw. So we'll see how much we get through today. And if we don't get through all the images, we'll pick these back up again next Tuesday and continue with it. I would also ask that all of you that didn't submit images, that you consider submitting some images over the next week. Uh, like I said, the information for this is in the article and you use WeTransfer, drop them in, and then I can put them in the article. So, <coughs> excuse me, if anybody, um, has any questions before I get started, um, let me know. And if not, I'll switch the screens over to the Capture One screen and uh, we'll begin uh, the show. I also want to mention that I am using Capture One. Um, obviously, there's Lightroom and a few others out there that you could use, but uh, my background, as many of you know, is I spent 13 years at Phase One before I uh, went to Loomis Landscape and eventually started Photo PXL. Um, so, Capture One has been my kind of uh, raw processor that I've turned to for many years. And it's uh, quite robust and does a lot of things. Like I said, this is not a tutorial on Capture One. We will be doing something like that in the future. But you can do the same sort of edits that I'm doing here pretty much in Lightroom or any other application. And really, it's not um, a big deal which one you use. It's kind of like a camera. I never had anybody ask me when I sold a picture to them what camera I use. And I really never heard anybody say, you know, how what did you use? Uh, what, what, what raw processor did you process those, those with? You know, the people that uh, purchase images or like to look at them really just want to see what your image looks like. And uh, they don't really ask. Uh, I've never had anybody ask those questions, unless they were a photographer thinking uh, that might work. So uh, Capture One is what we'll be working with. So uh, let me switch screens here, if you don't mind. And what you're looking at right now is uh, Capture One. And you can see these are all the images that we're going to work on today. Um, and what you're looking at is the default mode in Capture One. One of the things that Capture One has that is to its advantage is the ability to customize your workspaces. And I have a certain way that I like to work. And therefore, 
I have uh, several different workspaces. I have one which is a light table, which is sort of what you're seeing here, kind of like what we had back in the slide view days where I can basically do my initial edits. I can put all the images that I've imported in and up into a light table kind of view, uh, much like the grid view on, on Lightroom. And I can do initial quick edits and storm and rate them and so forth. And then I can go into my main editor. So today I'm gonna to go into my Windows workspace and I'm gonna come down here and excuse me if I'm looking up here while I'm doing this, it's uh, right here. And I can switch my workspace. So now you can see that uh, the previews and thumbnails that we're gonna be working with are on the left and the tools that I'm gonna be working with are on the right. And there are several different tool categories and all these can be arranged in whatever way you want. I keep a histogram floating out here and I have this thing here, which is annotations. And the nice thing about that is I can turn it on and I can, I can draw and you'll see how that works in a few minutes when we get into doing that, okay? So let's begin. So this is an image that Wayne sent. I think he sent in a couple images. And you know, the normal, the first thing I do when I uh, work an image is I look up here at the histogram and kind of take a look at the histogram to see if I am clipping on either end and whether I have space. I have a little space over here. Um, so that's important consideration. And there's a little bit of clipping here, but not much, mainly probably up here in the white area of the clouds. Um, I'm not gonna be too concerned with that because the way I think I'm gonna edit this picture is I'm gonna probably do a, a, a crop on it. Um, so when I look at an image, probably much like all of you do, you kind of say, what is the subject area that I wanna work with? And so to start with, everybody needs to learn cropping. Um, there are so many people that really don't crop or they crop the format. Cropping the format means they crop it to uh, what the frame size is or an eight by 10 or something along those lines. So, whoops. What I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of look at this image and say, what do I need? My subject here is not the, the clouds, they're nice clouds, but they're really this nice um, glacier and ice pack, most likely done in Antarctica or someplace along those lines. And uh, I would probably crop it long and narrow like that, as you see. The other thing I would immediately do is take a look at the horizon line. I think it's a little crooked, so I'm just gonna take my straightening tool and draw a line and just rotate that around so it looks a little bit more on the straight side. Um, so that was relatively easy. Next thing I do, and if I'm going too fast, somebody just speak up and say, hey, slow down. Because um, I tend to talk fast, but expect that people are listening quickly. So the Capture One has what's called a levels tool. I've got my mouse circling around it right now, and it's got an automatic button, which looks like a magic wand. Watch the image when I click on this. And what this does is remap the white points and the black points of the image and does a really nice job. So right like that, you know, I've now uh, remapped the image. I can take my midpoint, which is this here, and I can remap that too. So I've got, this is the first sets of controls I'm gonna do. And you can sort of either do this to taste or, you know, where you're looking for detail. Now, in a shot like this, I look for detail on the mountains and we're gonna get into uh, getting there first. So I'm going to use my pen and what I'm going to do is this area here, this area here, we're going to come back to here and try to fix this. We're going to darken this area here a little bit. This white area here and this sky, we're going to see if we can fix some of that. When I look at a photograph after I've done things as I'm trying to evaluate what I want to do with the image, I do squinting. I look and as you squint, you, you end up seeing bright spots and other spots that uh, you know, your eye goes to naturally, and it's more natural when you squint. Uh, some people like to turn the image upside down and look at it. Um, so everybody has their own way of looking at how and what areas need to, to be tackled. So um, what we'll do here is basically start. So first thing I'm gonna look at is this highlight area. The exposure is pretty good. So if I come over to the highlight, area and um, move it to the left watch what happens to the clouds now until you learn your controls one of the best ways to learn the controls is go both directions and then moderate your way backwards so what i'm doing is recovering the highlights now putting some detail 
in the clouds and the white areas without taking away from some of the other areas. Now, I also have a lot of darkness here in the, uh, the stone part of the mountain. So here, I'm just gonna do a little shadow recovery to start with just to see what's in there. So the camera has recorded some good detail in there, as you can see. The trick is trying to find a spot that seems sort of natural with it. And there we have it right about there. I also think that the image could be a little warmer. Uh, anybody that's ever shot in Antarctica knows that, you know, the images get to be a little cool because um, of all the white and so forth. And so I'm just going to come in here and add a little warmth. And you'll see the warmth come out in the stone part of the mountains a little bit and a little bit of tonality in the, uh, the clouds, okay? So everybody might see this differently depending on how your monitor is. So remember, I'm working with a, a calibrated monitor on my side of things and uh, you might be working with something uh, a little different on, on your side. So I've got this working pretty good. Now, the highlight areas here, uh, or we can handle this in Capture One in a couple different ways. I'm really concerned about this bright spots here. <coughs> so Capture One has a, a new tool now called luminosity masking. I don't know if you're familiar with that. But what it does is allows you to mask an area and then mask it further based upon the luminosity or the levels of brightness or darkness. And uh, this is a really very cool handy tool. So what I'm gonna come over here is the layers. Layers is down here. I'm gonna hit the bottom button here and open it up and I'm gonna go to my paintbrush and you can see right now my paintbrush is rather broad. Using the bracket keys, I can kind of lower it down. And I'm not gonna be really exact here. I'm just gonna pick some of the areas that I want to mask and I'm going to hit M um, so that the mask shows. You can also turn it on so that even as you're brushing uh, it, it shows. And I'm just going to take that bright area right there. Next I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here to the three dots in the layer area and pull down to what kind of mask I want. You have a, a clear mask, a burnt mask, fill mask, a rasterized mask, a feather mask, a refined mask, a Luma mask. We're going to be using the Luma range mask. So when I press this and select it, I get another dialog box that pops up. And what you're looking at up here is the white point to black point of the image and whatever is showing. Now, as I move this towards the white, you'll see that the mask is beginning to just find the area that's between the white point and the black point. See how that's working? And I can refine that a little bit more and I can just say now apply. And then all I need to do is kind of come up here on my exposure side of things and just gradually back that down so that there's some texture. You see how the brightness has gone down a little bit there? And uh, maybe I just want to throw a little contrast in there just a touch of a highlight recovery. So let's take a look at the before and after. There you can see how bright it is. There you can see how it's just darkened down a little bit and balanced out. Um, what I'm also going to do on the sky is I'm going to open up another mask and bring down a gradated mask, gradation mask like this. I'm just going to pull down and kind of go this far and just take it down just a hair like that. And once again, I'm just gonna take it down a bit along this way, just to throw some drama up there if I want. And that's looking pretty good. Now, in any one of the mask levels I make, I can also warm it up or cool it down, for example. So I can take this sky, for example, and I can throw yellow in it you know, to add for sunlight, or I can back it off to something just a little bit with a, a, a tad of color in it like you see there, okay? And once I'm satisfied with that, I can always come back down here once again and uh, take a look at there's the before and there's the after. Now, it's kind of affected the blue sky, so I can also now kind of create a second mask if I wanted to, do a much smaller gradated mask, this way, I think, I was going to try it, see what happens, just like that. And then I just come down a little bit more on the exposure there. And I also have a color editor, which I'm going to go back to my main level. Now, let me say something before I go too far. 
I'm not naming these masks. If uh, you were really kind of anal, you could say this would be uh, upper right corner. So <laughs> you can name these so that you can identify where they are, especially when you come back. But for the sake of uh, what we're doing here, I've just kind of opted out to not do that if, if that's all right with everybody. So um, I'm gonna go back to my background layer and I'm gonna use another great tool that Capture One has, and it's called the color editor. And I can pick these colors or I'm gonna go to advanced, but I pick my dropper and I'm just gonna put my dropper right here and you can see that it opens up and selects an area that's inside this white ring. And I can you know, change the width of it or change the depth of it if I want. And all I wanna do is just darken that sky down just a hair more like that. And add a little saturation like that. So that's kind of cool. Um, now, one last thing before I'm finished, I'm gonna go back to the front. And this area down here, I just wanna change there's a you know open up that front of that glacier and iceberg a little bit so i am going to add another quick mask do this and just kind of come up here like that and i'm going to hit m so i can see where it is take it up just a hair more boom and turn the mask off and now i can make my adjustments now watch i can make it brighter or darker or kind of lighter. And I can also just add a little bit of warmth into it like that, kind of put some tonality into the water and so forth. Now, the last thing I can do if I want, I don't know if it's so necessary in this image, is I can try adding just a little bit of a vignette to the image. So it draws your eye in and a long narrow image like this, it's kind of hard. But uh, there you go, you've got now kind of a, uh, a, a new look to this image. Let's take a look at the before and after. So using the before and after switch, that's what it looked like when we started. And that's what it's looking like now. Now, oh, I should tell you one other thing that I sometimes do with these images is when I look at an image like this, I also wonder what it would be like in black and white. And we do have a black and white tool. So I'm gonna come up here to image, I'm gonna clone this image. So I'm taking the image with all the adjustments and cloning it. Now I have two images and I'm gonna go back to this tab here. <coughs> I'm gonna go enable black and white. And now I've got a black and white image and the black and white image allows me to change the tonality based upon the color. So, you know, you can kind of come in here much like you can some other third party programs and you know, change some colors of things and make a nice black and white image. And this is actually a pretty nice looking black and white image too. So that's how we would do that shot. And what we can come back to later if everybody's interested is uh, everybody that did, did send an image and also sent their own version of a JPEG in or what they, uh, from their interpretation. And uh, we can take a, a look at that one. This, this is a beautiful composition. I love the fact that it's got an iceberg in the foreground, big one in the center, and a nice little one coming off to the side. And you've got this Arctic look. I call it the Arctic yellow. For some reason or other, the horizons and everything, whether you're in the northern or the polar regions in the south, have kind of a, a yellow glow to them. So we're gonna try to take a look at that, darken the sky down, and maybe kind of change the intensity of the iceberg a little bit, possibly using curves. So let's get the crop in place first. Um, <laughs> Yeah, way too much sky, that I agree with. Yep, there you go, so we're gonna come there. And the nice thing about this crop tool, I did set it up in the, um, you know, the, the nine section composition rule, so you can kind of see where things fall into place if you want. Uh, all you gotta do is kind of click on the mask or on the crop mask to see where that is. So, you know, obviously the icebergs in the middle, we got that other one down there. We could, you know, even crop down further on the sky. And really, because that sky, it's nice, but we don't want our eyes to go way into the sky. And this is a mistake that so many people make in their photographs. They take a beautiful photograph, say of a barn or a mountain, and the sky is so gorgeous that they want to include the sky, but that's not what the subject is. It's you know complimentary. So sometimes you've got to be willing to sacrifice 
something that while it looks pretty, actually in the end will detract from the way the image should look. So <coughs> what we'll do first here is the histogram's looking pretty good as you can see. We'll come over here into our processing tab. And we're not clipped. You can see here, we got a good histogram. Moving the midpoint may help things a little bit. I can kind of move that bright or darker. So I'm gonna move this down here and give it some drama like that. If that's okay. And um, I'm going to warm it up just a hair, not a lot, but it's got, it can use just a tad more warming. See how the yellow in the background is now beginning, the, you know, the, the haze sky back here. Watch how that kind of takes on its own, what I call that Arctic yellow glow. So there we go, we've got that. Maybe that's too much, hold on. It's a fine point where, you know, you want to adjust these things. Um, first thing I think I'm going to do is try just to do a gradated, uh, mask on the sky area. So we'll come down here to layers. We'll add a layer, bring in a gradient tool and we'll pull down on this. And that looks pretty nice. We're gonna have a really dark top and feeding into the areas where we already have lightness but not really affecting it as much as some of the other areas. So we're gonna kind of take that down just a bit now I can come back to any layer I want later on to uh, accent things even further if I'd like to. So um, we're gonna leave this one as it is. <coughs> now this iceberg here, I think you all might agree is, is pretty bright. Um, so we've got a couple ways we can do this. I'm gonna to go to create another layer and I'm gonna to go to my paintbrush layer and I'm gonna also make sure that I have um, auto mask checked down here. Okay, and what I'm gonna to try to do, I'm gonna size it up. And because I've got a white area with a really nice black area, I should be able to define a really nice mask uh, for this iceberg without having to go in the luminosity areas. Here we go. Should have started with a smaller brush. I was just trying to save time. Do you see how that's finding the edge as I do this? And where sometimes it doesn't work because I'm not the steadiest hand and I can just come in here with the eraser tool. And back it out. All right, good enough for government purposes. Yes. Could you zoom into that? Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. It does make it easier. It was real hard to see your brush and see what you were doing. Okay. There we go. Well, yeah. Yeah. That's better. How's that? A little bit better. Just like, well, until we get this um, cleaned up the hair more. I could have probably done the same thing with the luminosity mask. Um, How's that? It's a little bit brighter. And let's just come down on the exposure here just a hair. You don't have to come down a lot. Um, that's a half a stop, but it, it makes a huge difference. So that's how bright it was. That brings it down just a bit. We can throw some contrast in it and we can decide whether we want to take some saturation out of it along the way. And maybe I'm gonna pull down on the curve here a little bit, make it a little contrastier and de define 
and just pull up a little bit on the curve, make it a little bit of a nice S curve, throw some contrast and, and detail and grid into that. Let's go back and look at what this looks like fully at this point. Um, now we have the face of this iceberg, <clears throat> which we should look at. Just for giggles and grins, I'm going to try to do that one with the luminosity mask, if you don't mind, and um, we'll give it a shot here because there seems to be some nice whiteness here. There we go. Now I'm just going to click on the three dots over here on top of layers. Select loom the range and we'll move that out of the way so you can see it. Uh, maybe even go in a little bit here in a minute. And we're just going to start moving towards that bright areas that we want on that. And once we have that, we say apply and turn our mask off. And now we can throw some contrast in here or take some contrast away. We can darken that down just a bit, not a whole bunch, just a hair. We might even want to just take the midtones on the curve down a bit. And maybe just take a tad of saturation out. So let's see how we look before and after. Maybe toned it down too far. So sometimes you gotta finagle and play around with it. Now the last thing I'm going to do is try to put some detail in the water. And I'm just gonna open up the shadow a little bit since it's a darker area and I can add, you can see there's a lot of detail I can put in. It's just nice to throw something in that defines it a little bit. So, that might take us far enough here. Um, I can do some vignetting if I want, but just a hair maybe. And let's take a look at the before and after here. <clears throat> so there we have, which is actually a nice picture. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but you know, you can take an image so much further as you see here. Um, I'm looking at that iceberg in the foreground, might want to make that brighter. So. It's not uncommon for me to make an adjustment like this and leave it and then maybe come back to it later on after it kind of sinks in. So uh, you can see how that's worked. There, there's a lot of times where when we look at our raw images, whether they be on the back of the camera or when we look at them when we get them into a raw processing program, that we tend to basically say, there's nothing here. I'm going to just throw it out. There's not anything I can really work with. Um, but uh, I think as you get to uh, knowing the tools that you have and what you can do with them, you'll find that you can do a lot more with a, a raw image. If you've got the data in your histogram, and this is a very weird histogram, you don't have clipping necessarily. You can all see the histogram here. Um, and it's not a you know it's not one of those histograms where there's a lot of detail but you're not clipped, you're not losing data information. So before we start an image like this, um, let me make the image a little bigger so we can work with it. One of the things that I like to do is take a look and find out what we have in the shadow area that we can work with. And this gives you an idea. If you were gonna look at this image this way, you don't know that there's a lot of gold in that dragon. And it looks like it's some kind of metal dragon sitting on top of a lot of moss and you know there's a lot of things that are sort of as I'm looking at this image distracting let me kind of point those out to you okay that I'm looking at I got this here down here I got that got a lot of bright areas up here and strands of grass here um, and this useless this is kind of like information area up here that I don't need there's a big black area certainly don't want that so the key here is to kind of Find a crop that can come down. This is completely useless area as far as the image goes. <clears throat> Concentrate on this and try to bring the gold up in that as we can see here. So look at look as we bring the shadows up, 
there's all sorts of detail there that we can recover and work with. And at the same time, we can work with our tools to get rid of some of that uh, green grass and stuff too. So that's my thinking here, and this, let's get started with it. And we'll start. Okay. First thing, let's just get a crop done. So we'll go to our crop tool and kind of crop down to about there where the subject is and maybe in just a bit. And maybe over here just a bit. Good. Once the crop is done, I can take a look at what that image looks like. Now, one of the things that I think it needs to fix it is warming it up. So let's first off, you might, and let me kind of do a side note here um, so you understand these tools that I've put here, I've set up in the way I like to work with. Histogram at the top, remember I always have one floating too. Start off with white balance, adjust your exposure, recover your shadows and highlights, add clarity, levels I sometimes either do at the beginning or the end. Um, uh, so that doesn't have to do anything there. Curves I would usually use as an adjustment after I've gotten a number of other things done. Then I could add vignetting, there's spot removal, and then I've got presets and things down here. We're not going to talk about presets on this trip, but you know there are things that are styles that you can have where I can go and click and take a look at the, the image and uh, different styles and so forth. I'm, I'm not one for styles, mainly because I kind of like to create my own styles um, and, and work with those. So you, you can all see, you can see styles pop in as we move through here. And we'll do styles maybe on the last night as we look at more detail on things. So anyway, let's start here. I'm gonna warm this image up. Knowing that it's in the shade and everything, it'd probably be around 5,400. So I'm gonna to go to about that area, which is 5,600 roughly. You can see I brought some of the gold back. I've got that nice, warm, mossy color, especially here in the highlight areas. Uh, so that kind of has come out nice. Now the next thing I want to do is maybe throw a little contrast in. But while I'm looking at this picture, I want to be careful and, and realize that I've got an area down here of black, and I don't want to have black. Up here in this border here, watch where my arrow is, when I have any pointer or any tool visible, I also, it serves as a densitometer, and you can see that I'm really close to pure black there, around four and three is an average, but I'm not pure black. So I want to be able to recover um, the, the small areas in the shadow that invite my eye to explore the image further. So once I've kind of figured out some of this, first thing I'm going to do is try to recover the shadow areas. And so you can see now that some of that area has opened up quite nice as I'm moving through and the statue areas become a little golder. I'm gonna maybe just give a little more exposure and brighten it up. And then these brighter areas down here, and especially up here on the statue, I'm gonna use my highlight recovery tool and slide that down and try to put some detail back into that, that statue area. So what I'm going to do is just gonna throw in a couple little mask areas here. And I'm just going to take it down just a fraction. Really, really, really small. Just enough that that area is not grabbing my attention. Okay. And I might do another one where I just do this other area here. So working on images, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of an art in a sense. You, it, it, to, to me, I find it a, a peaceful kind of time, a time where you know you can look at your image and you know kind of make some adjustments. See how that's now darkened down, and we're we're getting a little bit better. Um, before I go too far, I'm going to create. A, I'm going to use my spot tool here, and 
select my healing tool and just enlarge this a bit. I'm gonna get rid of some of these distractions. You can see that this is a kind of a, a healing tool like we have in Photoshop. I'm just gonna get rid of these bright spots. Um, I don't want my eye wandering away from what the subject is here. There we go, that's nice cleaned up. This piece here disturbs me. What I try to do is avoid anything that's gonna take my eye away from the subject. Now, when I come up here, I see, oh my God, I forgot to get that bright area. So I'm gonna create another layer. And it, it seems like it's a lot of work, but it's not really a lot of work. And um, remember, you can do sort of the same thing in, in Lightroom. It operates a little differently, but it, it'll get the point across. Um, from you and we're just gonna to tone that down just a bit like that. All right, so we've already improved the picture quite a bit. These areas up here, I'm gonna go back to my cloning tool, my heel layer, and I'm gonna get rid of these couple of bright spots up here. Now, I know that there's a lot of different schools of thought about how far and whether you should remove things or not. Um, and something like this, I think it works because it allows you to concentrate on the image and not go astray. Um, we have a friend, Jeff knows him, some of you might know him, but, and you'll know who I'm talking about if you, you do, but he's the kind of guy that takes a picture and if there's a Coke can in a picture, he leaves it that way because that's the way it was. Um, frankly, um, I want somebody to buy my picture, and I'm sure that if they want to buy it, they don't want the Coke can in the picture. And if I've got the tool later to take it out, such as this, I'll take the, the can out. So everybody can have their own philosophy as far as which way they want to work and how far they want to go with something. Um, I tend just to say if I can improve the image by taking the distractions away, I've accomplished a lot. So the next thing I'm going to do is take a make sure I'm on my background layer. And, oh, I'm thinking here. Now, here's where you have to think. I'm, I've got two choices. I can try to go into the background layer, which I'm going to do. I wanna be able to brighten that dragon up just a hair. Um, because it's gold and there's no other color, I should be able to use the color editor to accomplish this just fine. Or worst case scenario, I paint a mask on it. Does, doesn't have to be super good. And then I use the color editor and the color editor only affect the areas that are inside that mask. Let's first off try it in the background layer uh, because there aren't a lot of similar colors and see if we can fix this a little bit. So I'm going to pick this gold area right here and you can see it picks it. And I don't know if I need saturation as much as I can lighten it back up. See how that's lightening up or darkening? You can see some of it transferring in the, the overall picture too, but not to the point where I think it's distracting at this point. And then let's pick that gold layer. I'm gonna throw a little saturation there and try to brighten that up also. So the cool thing about the color editor is a lot of photographers actually use it sort of as a micro lighting tool. So if I pick that little tiny area there and try to lighten it up, that pops it up there. Come in here and pick that gold, lighten that up and also. These two squares down here, you can see them, one's a before and one's an after, and then it tells you the delta numbers changed and so forth like that. So, you know, you can kind of go through here and, and make these minute adjustments to the minute colors, you know, small little colors, and, and make it the way you'd like to see it. All right, now the last thing I would do is make sure I'm still back in the background layer, and last but not least, I'd throw a vignette around this like this to make this image pop. Okay, and that's pretty nice. Um, so let's take a look at before and after. You guys can tell me what you think. So that's what we started with. That's what we ended with. So you can see that there's a, a quite a bit of difference. Yeah. So a lot of people would say, you know, this image, ah, there's nothing here, I messed up. I should have done a better job lighting. It should have had some sunlight on it, but essentially, you know, all the data was there. You just need to know how to pull that out and, and play with it and, and make that image what you want. So I, I hope you can see that and see what the difference is. 
you can see that we got rid of the you know the little blind areas we opened up the gold we have nice highlights got nice details now one of the things that we haven't done yet and we could go into a whole course on this is is actually doing sharpening um, so I haven't done sharpening because a lot of times I do that at the very last thing before I do anything else but uh, Capture One does have sharpening tools. I have some presets I like to work with, and I just can touch that back up a little bit. And usually sharpening shows up in the light and dark areas. And one of the things that I think Lightroom does a fine job with, uh, and I'm pretty good with Lightroom, Jeff may disagree, but I know enough about it to be dangerous, and I've worked in it quite a bit. <clears throat> it does have a mask, and it does allow you to use that mask and see what areas are being sharpened. And so you can do selective sharpening and you know you can see where the changes are. Normally the sharpening comes in the, between the edges of light and dark areas. So uh, I've just thrown just a tad in. I have presets made and of course you can save any number of different presets. And you can see the upper right hand image here, this monitor image. You can see them change as I scroll up. See how the more details pop in for different areas and different settings. So, you know, that picks it up and improves the image uh, pretty much. Kevin? So, yes? Did you see the question about how masks affect file size? Uh, no, I didn't see that because I'm just concentrating on the image. I don't have the uh, chat thing going on. Okay, well, I just, I just want to make sure that, I didn't, that maybe you didn't already answer it. But um, Joe Vondersar wanted to know, how do masks affect file size? That's a good question. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I've never looked to see. I don't think it really affects it at all. All it is is a set of instructions and coordinates. Um, it's not like you know a, a true mass would be. Um, so it might add a few K to it, because essentially all you're doing here is adding instructions, no different than when you do contrast and brightness and darkness. Um, so uh, the only times you would see that, like in Photoshop, is if you're adding layers. So if you actually took an image and added a layer, you know, you're duplicating images and doing things like that. We're not doing any kind of duplicate layers and so forth at this point. All we're doing is masking and uh, basically saying between these coordinates, we want to be able to put whatever changes we want to put in on. So um, it's probably complicated the way it tracks it and so forth, but I do not believe it adds uh, anything in file size. Uh, if it does, it's very insignificant. Okay, so, thank you. Okay, Deborah, just pop them my way if you got any, because um, you know I'm, I'm I have everything turned off that I'm just concentrating. Okay, on. that's the only one. All right, thanks, baby. Yeah. Cool. All right, so that kind of came out pretty cool, don't you think? Uh, let's go to this image. Huh. Now you know. Be careful, Kevin. <laughs> okay, I guess that means Jeff did this image. And what do you see when you look at this image? Uh, let's take a look here. Uh, you've got a beautiful sky. It's shot. Look at the shadows on the ground. Um, I have a loop tool here I can use. So as I look at the shadows on the ground, they appear to be long shadows. And uh, look at the refraction. Jeff, if you'd use something other than a pocket camera, you wouldn't have this refraction that shows up in the corners. Um, so here's what I'm going to be doing and let me show you. Um, first thing I hate uh, and I, I have a lot of problems with are lines, buildings leaning in like that. See these lines here are leaning in. This line is leaning in. That line is leaning in. The center is okay. I, there's no excuse for leaning in pictures anymore. Of course, most of that can be fixed easily as I'm going to show you in uh, in of the raw processing. I love the kind of whole kind of color here. I might want to warm and yellow this up a little bit more. I might want to change the sky to be a little bit darker blue. And because it's at sunset, you can see some yellow tonality already in the sky, but I might want to add just a hair more. I'm not sure yet. Um, so the way we're going to go. Now this door, this is also something I want to fix. It's a dark spot in an area that I want to turn a little bit brighter, not only to match the uh, the hat, you know, the the, the the signature hat, 
Um, hold on a second, I just that went away. Um, so I want to open up this area, and I might do the same thing here. I don't know if there's any surprises inside these windows here. So we might want to throw a mask in there and do a little recovery and see what we come out with. So there's a little bit of work to do on this image. Um, it's a cool picture. Uh, it's Where is this picture done, Jeff? Tucumcari, New Mexico. Ah. Along Route 66, although it's not on that, it's not on the route. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is let's correct perspective. Actually, if I remember correctly, let me get rid of this crop altogether here. There's a lot more in this image. I'm sorry, I had it pre-cropped. Um, See this junk in here? Obviously, we're going to get rid of all that junk uh, at the same time. <clears throat> okay. Um, before we get rid of the junk, we always want to try to do the crop, uh, the, the perspective control first. Very hard to see here, but in Capture One, we have these lines, and we can do it in, in like a, doing a square. But what I'm doing is I'm going to take one point, put it at the bottom, and the other point up here in the corner. And we can kind of do the same thing on the other side. I hope you can see that one of the things I've asked the engineers uh, at Capture One to do is make bigger lines. I don't know why they're such thin lines. And then I have an apply button in here. Watch carefully as the perspective is changed. Boom, just like that, we've now got it, our edges a little bit straight and it's a little bit nicer to looking on in the image. Um, now, if you're the artist and you don't wanna do that, then you know that, that's your call. Uh, I prefer trying to, to get rid of that stuff. And then I'm gonna crop in, we don't need that light standard, but I do wanna just have the edge of the building. Now, we could go both ways. We could say we don't want the edge of the building, but then we don't have any idea how long the building is where we can define a boundary as long as it's not a triangle and crop right to that light post. And at the same time, kind of come in and get rid of this window over here and that railing, so kind of like that. So there's somewhat semi-balanced. And then there's a triangle down here. I hate triangles in the composition, so I might come up a little bit to try to eliminate a little bit of that triangle. And I want to throw in just a hair more sky, but not a lot. You know, there's no need to, to go any further. So that being that, we'll now go in and start doing our basic adjustments. The histogram is pretty good, which is pretty amazing for an image done by Jeff. We have a, a good point, no clipping. And uh, first thing we might wanna do is just mess around with our, our midpoint area there and just kind of see what happens if we move the midpoint a bit. And I'm trying to look for a certain magic. The glow of this blue or greenish aqua color and over here. So I'm going to be working with a number of tools to try to balance that out. Also, I think the image, because it's done at night, can go just a hair warmer. So I'm going to take it up to probably about 6100. Kind of gives that more of an evening effect. The clouds have gotten a little bit warmer. I could probably stretch it even further. Once again, I always say, take your, 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 uh, sliders and, and go both directions with them so you can see what the effect is. I know now if I'm working at this that around 8,000 I get these nice beautiful yellow clouds. Might be too warm for everything else, although maybe not. Uh, let's kind of compromise and show up right about there. Don't know, I'm going to take the exposure down just a bit because I want to be able to add some contrast. I'm going to recover the shadow area now. So I'm trying to open up the shadow area just to be a little more open. I love this kind of, kind of, it kind of brings me into what this doorway is, but I don't want this doorway to be pure black. So we're gonna fix that with a luminosity mask in a second. This area here is also pretty bright you know, along the area of the, the, the hot top of the hat where it's catching the sunlight. So we're gonna kind of pull a, that highlight down just a bit, see if we can recover in there like that. So far, so good. Now, let's get a luminosity mask layer in here. 
If everybody's still okay in the time, um, I want to do this image and maybe one more, and then we'll save the rest of the images for the, the next Tuesday. I said this would be about an hour or just a little longer. Um, so I don't want to keep you, and then we can have a couple questions if anybody has any. So I'm going to draw this, going to grab that, and I'm going to basically draw a mask. of this area. Now, in Capture One, if I wanted to, I could hit, hold the Shift key, and if I'm making something, I can make it automatically go square, um, you know, straight line masking and, and so forth. So there are a lot of little shortcuts that I'm not necessarily taking advantage of here. Once again, as you've seen in before when I'm doing this in the luminosity side of things, I'm going to take the bright side down until the mask <clears throat> shows up only in those black areas, like that. Come up a little bit more, come up to just where it begins to be affected. And I'm gonna stretch it just a bit. And there's the mask, that's where it's gonna be. I'm gonna say, apply, and I'm gonna turn that off. And now I can kind of see what's inside that area and open that up. And you can see as I'm opening up, Oops. Oh, I'm in the highlights, excuse me. Thought I was in exposure, here we go. You can see I can really brighten that area up and I just don't wanna brighten it up so it's unnatural, but I wanna brighten it up so I can see some fun stuff you know, and let my eye explore the picture a little bit in a reflection of that window. So I can, I've done that. Now, let me go back to the background layer before I build another mask. Let's see if there's anything in this area here, okay? So how do we do that? We can simply come up here and we are at minus 0.2. We can do two things. We can just open up our exposure and there's not a lot in there. There's a wall, there's a, looks like a table. So um, there, don't look, there doesn't look like there's any treasures in there. So I'm just gonna back this back down to where Roughly, I had it. And be happy with that, okay? Um, now comes the, the interesting part here. What are we going to do with the sky? Um, uh, if it was just a sky without something pointing in it, we could do uh, a, a linear gradated mass that come down. I, I do want to do some stuff with the sky. So I think what I'm going to do is just kind of try to do uh, a quick mask and just to see what happens. So I'm going to add my mask layer again. Select the brush tool. And this is where I'm going to actually use my shift key. So I'm going to I'll turn it on here first. Whoops. Uh, Click once. Less caffeine, Kevin. Yeah, I guess. Oh, I have it on gradated to shoot. Oh, well, let's start over again. I'm just gonna draw it real quick. Uh, the hands of a surgeon. Okay, come down this side. I have auto mask turned on, so remember I'm trying to keep that that circle in there, and I'm trying to move too fast, um, just because I don't want you all to watch me just draw a mask. Remember how they used to do the cooking shows where they had everything in the oven already done? Yeah. That's kind of how that should be done here, right? So um, let's do a It fill. is done already. It just happens to be in Lightroom. <laughs> oh. Oh, Jeff, someday. I, you know, I know you're watching this and going, wow, Lightroom mask doesn't paint as quick as this one does. It was a good catch on your part. Did you have dinner at this place, Jeff? Actually, no. And according to the Yelp reviews, 
the last year, um, the lady that owns the place has become a, like a um, Mexican food Nazi. <laughs> so, uh, only on Route 66 would you find that. That's cool. Yeah. But uh, actually, Tucumcari, the Route 66, I've got a couple of really nice shots from there. The old theater, um, there's the curio, curio shop, and then there's a couple of, of hotels that have just a gorgeous exterior. So that was a very productive trip. Cool. All right. Oh, well, my gosh. We'll, we'll miss that little part there. All right, so we've kind of created a mask of the sky. It's you know, kind of refine it a little bit. And the cool thing is you can always go back in later and, and do that. Um, first thing I'm going to do is warm the sky up just a bit. That's nice. Not, not too far yet, but just enough. I'll throw a little contrast, a little saturation in there. And then take the exposure down a bit. That's kind of cool. Um, I could probably go a little further on the blue. I would like to see that as a deeper blue. So um, <coughs> I remember since I'm still in the mask layer, if I click this blue area here and saturate it, you know, you can kind of, you can take all the blue out if you want, or you can just kind of put some stuff back in and maybe just darken it. And maybe the sky's a little too yellow now that I look at it. So this is where you fuss around a little bit with things until you kind of find a, a spot that it kind of works. So I'm going to call it quits at that area. I'm just going to go back to the background layer. I have Let's a question. Just, yes? Can you enlarge the entire image by the door? Um, yeah, I can zoom in there. Hang on a sec. Let me turn the before and after out. Hang on. Want to go in further? No, no, no. That, that's okay. I, I, it t from further back, it looks like the door is attached at the top and the bottom, <clears throat> but it goes right, right smack through to the uh, to the restaurant. That there's nothing holding it, but it's actually a window. Yeah, uh, it's like okay. two side windows or something. Yeah. Okay. No. Ah. Okay. Cool. There you go. Yeah, you know, one of the things that we, when, when you work on images or I work on them uh, at home, sometimes I've been doing everything so you can see the whole shot, but there's nothing to stop you from coming in here and really going in with a brush and fine tuning things too. You know, I could come in here with my spot tool, for example, um, once I'm back on my background layer. Wow, that's a big spot, isn't it? Woo! Um, uh, we'll go in the healing brush tool. And, you know, I can kind of really, depending on how meticulous you want, you can kind of come in here and get rid of the fine tuning thing. So if I wanted to, I could kind of brush that sign out like that. It depends on where you want to do it, but, um, you know, it's all relative to where things need to be. So anyway, um, I'm not happy with the sky. I'd probably work with it, but I don't want to spend a little more time on it just to, to fine tune it. Here's the before picture. Uh, so you can see there's before and here's after. So um, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. Definitely would fix the blue sky a little more and that's easy to do. I just have to make some adjustments. I have to ask myself, am I happy with those clouds the way they are? And that's always a tough call. It's like, when we're in Antarctica, we look at icebergs and we have to say, are we happy with the color of the iceberg? What is the right color for an iceberg? You know, and it can be a number of different colors. They are blue, but the question is, what's the right blue? And the same thing with the sky here. There's a number of things we could do to fix the sky even more and, and uh, pop the contrast uh, with it. I could go into uh, curves, for example, and uh, do something along those lines. So th there's a a couple things that could be done if we wanted to. Um, so just kind of saying. You want uh, comments from the peanut gallery? Sure, well, you're the originator. What do you have um, as a comment? Well, 
one comment is if you're going to correct the perspective, you ought to fucking correct it. <laughs> Just on the right side, it's still keystone, and on the left, it's straight. So it actually kind of makes me nauseous. All right. Well, but, we can. We can it's easy no, to don't worry about it. Because here's the thing, uh, you know, Alan uh, Rio has that, uh, um, you know, the image Nazis. Yeah, the rule is you don't like keystones or tilting back, except for the fact that the image itself had that um, pentagon shape in the center, and yep. I really liked the fact that the, uh, and in fact. Do you mind if I show people what I did? I, I have yours. I can show it. Well, what? I can't. Well, you want to go ahead and go put yours up if you have it up. Yeah, well, you don't have uh, screen sharing turned on for attendees. Uh, no, but I, I might have that picture hiding. So give me yep. a second. Okay. Uh, but the point is that, that there are rules and there are times at which you obey the rules, and then there are times that you say, fuck it. That's how you had it. Yeah, that's how I had it. So a, a, a couple of points. Um, uh, yes, uh, definitely working on the clouds from where you were at. You went in the same direction that I went. Um, um, uh, but the, the one point was that I, I really did like the fact that the uh, walls on the far left and right tilted back in the same way that the center uh, tilted back. And so it kind of worked with the sombrero. Uh, but that's, you know, subjective. And yeah, it is. Uh, your crop and my crop are about the same because most images will tell you how it wants to be cropped. Now, some photographers, some elitists think that, oh, you, sh you should crop to the format of your um, uh, camera, uh, you know, uh, 35 millimeter full frame. You shouldn't crop, uh, but we got over that, didn't we, Kevin? Yeah, I, and I, once again, it's you know, it's funny. People have rules, and you're the only one that you have to answer to, as well as, of course, if it's you know for a customer. So you should be the one that's happy out of here, and you shouldn't be like, oh God, I wish I could crop it, but so and so said I couldn't, so I can't. That's yeah. you know bullshit, you know. Yeah. Um, so, so anyway, that would be that's the comments from the peanut gallery. You know, Jeff, on the uh, the tilting of the the sides. I you know I guess lately, and maybe it's because I see it so often where these tools are available, and you know, the, your picture is not so exaggerated. At at one point when I looked at it, I thought maybe the, everything's kind of got that tilt like the front doorway did. Uh, but then I realized by looking at the way the windows are moving and everything that they're not up and down straight. So um, to me, it's just one of those things that. Is a tool there that you can use as perfection, but if you want to leave it and not, and it's your picture and you're happy, then that's fine. I think overall, I will stress all the time. First off, you should be able to use all the tools you can, but you should be the one that is able to drive those tools to the image that you want. And um, I think that's the most important part of what we do as photography is when we take the picture, I don't know about you, but I feel happy. And you know, when we get to the point where we're processing and I get a picture that looks pretty good and is a lot better than when it started out, I feel happy. And nowadays, just to feel happy is a pretty damn good kind of thing to have, if you know what I'm saying. So um, that's uh, where we are with it. So um, anyway, this was Jeff's picture. And um, Well, uh, the, re the reason I, I, I sent it in and I did not process it just to make it difficult for you to match in Capture One. I didn't do that. This is an image that I posted to the Visual Conservancy, uh, mm -hmm. that you know Facebook group that you and I are in. Yep. And it's one of my most liked images, which kind of surprised me. And Carl made it into a banner for the group for the week. So uh, that's why I sent it. Well, it, it's cool. And I, it's interesting, you kind of saw the same thing I did with the way the light is, long shadows, that the, the, the cloud should be on a little bit of a warmer side. Yeah. Um, I would definitely have spent a little more time working that sky, um, and I would have maybe had to do a, a couple tries. One of the cool things about any of these programs, like even Capture One, I could make three different layers and three different versions of the sky and turn them on or off to the way I like them. So, you know, if, at first you don't succeed, 
you can just turn that layer off so that you don't waste your time in case you need to come back to it and start again and, and fine tune it to, you know, you kind of have a couple variations and then you can kind of click them on or off until you find the one through all the effort that makes you, you like it the best. So, you know, you've got that sort of ability uh, to do. And of course, the question really is how much time do you really want to spend on an image and how far should it go? You know, one of the things as I look at this image that Jeff could have done just as successfully is, and not to be too critical, Jeff, but we could have gone to um, a square crop. And I did think about this a little bit and just balance it out between the windows and the sombrero without all the extra wall. So, you know, when you look at a picture, it can go a bunch of different ways. So there's not one that says it's right or wrong. It's the one that pleases you the most, you know, where it, it matters uh, in, in the scope of things. So, square, does, square does not please me, Kevin. Well, you, you, you've got some difficulties you need to work through. Um, as we all do, some of us don't like squares. Some of us don't like 16 by nine panoramas. There are some photographers that shoot only in that kind of, you know, panoramic direction. You know, the, um, the Peter, what's his face from Las Vegas? Um, you know who I'm talking about. Peter Lick. Peter, Peter Licks or, you know, the Freedmans. I mean, and they use those things well. I, actually, if you look in the, how do I do this here? Oops, right, right there. You can see one of my long pictures. I shoot a lot of pictures in that long kind of style also, just because sometimes they work well in a landscape. But I, I don't stick to one format. I, I stick to the format of the image that works well for the, the subject that I'm shooting. So um, that's kind of how you know I like to do it. Um, it, it we're, we've gone past our hour. We have next week in the pile, and we hope that we get some more images. We've got a few more images to, to do. Let's kind of take a look here what there was left and then so you can see where we're going to go next week. Um, we have a couple of abstracts like this and I really do want to play with these because this one shows, these show how cropping can work and how you can rotate an image and change everything. You know, this is one that looks a little weird, but just watch what happens. Look at the histogram on this one. It's just a peak in the middle. So if we remap that, look what happens to it. We, we, we are already, closer to where we were. You know, this is a really interesting picture that I just scribbled over. <laughs> is this your picture, Jeff? Yes. <laughs> See all that stuff that's there in the red? That's what I'm going to do to that picture next yeah, week. Yeah, it looks like it was processed by a three-year-old. <laughs> I'm kind of using the Trump Sharpie method. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then this picture here, which is, uh, this. I don't know who sent this in. Um, I'd have to look at it here. It's. Um, uh, Nelson, um, this will be a fun picture to do because it's not meant to be a color picture. It's, it's, it's meant, in my opinion, to be a black and white picture. So I'd like to, to run through that one a little bit next week if, uh, if we can. Um, so we have some more things. I hope you guys enjoyed this. You know, we could stay at this for hours, which is sometimes, you know, what I like to do. Um, but, uh, you know, this was kind of a, a fun chance to get together and, uh, you know, share with you how, I like to look at images. I, I see this evolving into something a little more where uh, we talk a little bit about the tools and we can actually go into some third party programs such as uh, the Nick programs, uh, which are pretty cool or the, the Topaz programs and or even uh, Luminar. So if, if you're all happy with this, you know, drop me a line if, if there's any suggestions you can say to make it easy, easier. If you didn't submit an image and you'd like me to play with it and uh, open it up for discussion uh, and I would encourage more discussion amongst everybody if you have questions and things please don't hesitate to ask but um, this is a good chance I mean one of the things my, my, my dream of building photo PXL is to build a, a community and this is one way as a community you know we can do some things together and make our photography better and maybe in a year we're gonna be out of this pandemic and you know we'll find ways to meet each other in person and you know have some fun that way too so before I say goodbye and close, are there any questions that anybody has at all? Just one. Yes, sir. All of these things that you were working on, they were raw images? Yes. Now you can tell the difference. Every camera has a different raw um, or suffix to it. Uh, like Nikon has an NEF. Um, 
Uh, Leica has a DNG version of a RAW. Um, Cam uh, Canon has CR2 or, or 3 or 1. They have different things. Uh, Sony is ARW. Um, so, but they're all RAWs. And really, you need to work from a RAW. RAW has all the data in it. So you, my, my philosophy is do as much on the raw image as you can. The more you do on the raw image, the more you're working with actually the raw data before you turn it into pixels and throw it out there into a TIFF or a JPEG. Um, and there are times where you need to actually get to a TIFF or a JPEG and you know, do some things that uh, have to be done in some other kind of program like Photoshop. But nowadays, most of these raw uh, programs allow us to do so much more without um, having to get to Photoshop that you know, the things that you do in Photoshop are a lot less. Um, there's so much that can be done in photography and Photoshop. We could go into a whole thing about luminosity laying layers and you know, build 50,000 layers on top of each other. In the upcoming video you're gonna see from Stephen Wilkes, uh, he has images with hundreds and hundreds of layers. And you know, where he's just putting a, a little individual in and laying different things into the image. That's why I really encourage you when we uh, get that video and that article done to spend some time and watching what this guy does. I mean, he spent 36 hours taking one photograph, uh, his day to night book. And uh, he's got a great slideshow. We, we've got some really fun stuff of, uh, that uh, Stephen's first exhibit back in, you know, the very beginning of inkjet prints, probably the very first real inkjet print exhibit ever in America. Uh, so there's a lot of fun, and uh, that'll be a kind of a fun thing to do too. So um, we want to just have some fun with you guys and get out there and do some pictures. So uh, don't forget, send me some raw files if you have them. If you have questions afterwards, write them down. We can address them again next week or the week after. We'll see how these next two weeks go, and then based upon that, uh, we'll try to pick other ways to get in and, and do some things together. Um, and I'm going to invite some people to come in, you know, after this, this next two weeks are done to, to do things with me. Maybe I'll turn an evening over to Jeff and, uh, or somebody else and see what they do. So everybody, thank you very much. Thanks for running, being part of PXL. Um, I'm having a blast. It's kind of a neat dream and we got so much planned. Um, I'm going to start doing a lot more gear stuff over the next month or two. So uh, we'll mix that in with all the aesthetic stuff and other things we're doing also. So. I want to thank, thank you. you. And, uh, thank you very much. Thanks, well, everything good. And if you have any thoughts or questions, don't hesitate. Just drop them my way, okay? Kevin and Jeff could uh, interact a little more. It was pretty dry. Uh, we're both on our best behavior. <laughs> Literally. Honest <laughs> God, I was, I was trying to keep my fucking mouth shut because every step of the way I'm thinking, Jesus Christ, Kevin, I wouldn't do that. But... <laughs> Yeah, and of course, I would be saying the same thing. So it's best that we both respect each other along those lines and we'll leave it at that. You know, it didn't work that well. Anyway, it's always fun to have Jeff here, especially when he doesn't have a hole in his head. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, look, you know, we're, we're, we're in these times. Um, I, I have known Jeff for a very long time. We've traveled to just about every corner of the, the planet we can, and we've done a lot of photography together, and just one-on-one -on -one adventures together. Um, I'm always glad to come home, but uh, it's always a lot of fun. Jeff, Jeff is a great friend and very, very knowledgeable. So, and uh, it's, it's, we've been to some places where it would have been really, really easy to bury the body. Yep. <laughs> I would just need an extra large size shovel for you, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Feed you to a leopard seal. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> you're the one that got bit by one, so there you go. That was the first seal. <laughs> so anyway, we can tell some stories. Maybe sometime we'll... Uh, Jeff and I did an adventure last year. We haven't shared with anybody yet, but maybe we can uh, do one night where we share our Yosemite to our... Actually, I showed that slideshow <clears throat> of our trip um, during our Meet the Photo Pixel team. Pixel. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't show any pictures of you. So I've got a few there. Well, That's when we visited Yos Yosemites, right? Yos yeah, Yosemite. 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 <laughs> Yosemite. Yeah. He got uh, Sequoia right. What were the well, odds you know, that he would get Sequoia right and Yosemite wrong? <laughs> it's like everything else. 
anyway, guys, have a nice evening. Um, it was a lot of fun. Send me some more images and, uh, you know, away we go. It, it's always fun to see what you can do with them. And uh, I have a blast and um, I love you all. So take care and be safe, okay?